Okay, we're just at 6.30, so I think we can get um, get started. Uh, I will start by asking Martin to kick us off. Yes, thank you, Susan, and uh, welcome everyone to our fifth Community Liaison Group meeting. Um, so this is a little bit different, uh, our first virtual meeting, so thank you for making the time. I know it's a sunny day out there and slowly the temperatures are rising. So make, thanks for making the time uh, for joining us tonight for the for two hours of, of water quality and water budget talk. Um, would you like me, Susan, to uh, kind of introduce the, uh, the project team and people are on, that are on the, uh, on the call here? So starting with myself, most of us will know each other already from previous meeting, but my name is Martin Keller. I'm the Source Production Program Manager for the Lake Erie uh, region. And with me, we have uh, Sonia Stronatka, also from the GRCA. And then from Center Wellington, we have Colin Baker and Kyle Davis. And from the county, Sarah Wilhelm. And then we have from the ministry, we have Catherine Baker. And from Lura, our facilitation consultant, we have Susan Hall, Jim Fott, and our whiz behind the scenes, Amit Taizand. And then from uh, Matrix, our consultant, we have Dave Van Fleet and Jeff Melchin. And I think uh, I don't, didn't, hopefully it doesn't miss anybody. Thank you. Uh, over back to you, Susan. Okay, great. Thanks, Martin. Um, so, as we get started, uh, what I'd like to do is just do a quick round of introduction for our uh, CLG members. And um, Amitai is going to un unmute you as you go. So um, Chris, I'm just gonna do based on the grid that I see. So Chris Neville, do you wanna say hi? So Chris, you'll have to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Hi, I'm Chris Neville. I'm uh, here on behalf of Andrian Simard, who uh, many of you probably know is on maternity leave. That's great. Thanks. And welcome, Chris. Thank you. Um, I'll go to Dave uh, Blacklock. Dave Blacklock is selling, uh, sorry, going to water watchers. Great. Welcome, Dave. Uh, Don? Don, can you say hi? Oh. Hi, Don. Uh, hi. Did everybody get that or no? Yep, now we can hear you. Okay, yeah, just uh, Don Valerie from Highland Pines Campground and Pine Meadows in Bellwood. Okay, great. Welcome, Don and Jan. Hi, I'm Jan Beveridge from Save the Saber Water Group. Great. Welcome, Jan and Jeremy. Hi, I'm... Uh attending on behalf of Granite Homes and the land development and building industry in Center Wellington. And I'm new to this group, so this is all new to me. Okay, well, welcome, Jeremy. And, and the Zoom format's all new for all of us, so <laughs> we'll be learning together for that piece. Uh, and Tom. Uh, I'm Tom Nuds, and uh, I'm general community member on the community liaison group. Okay, great. And uh, George? as well. Oh, we hi. Yeah, it's George Sousa. I'm really here just as a technical support. That's okay. Technical it's all working support. right now. I can confirm that it's, we're live casting as we speak. So it all worked really well. Thank okay, you for your help, George. No problem. Perfect. All right. So with that, um, what we'll do is um, we'll, we'll have all of all of the folks will be on mute as we get uh, kicked off here. And Amitai, I'll ask if you could pull up the slide deck for us. That would be great. Absolutely. One moment. Perfect. And if you can just go to the next slide. So as Martin said, this is this is a new format for all of us. I'm really excited that we could still get together and continue uh, the conversations. 
uh, with the community liaison group. So we're obviously on our Zoom webinar tonight and uh, folks are coming uh, on the meeting through their computer or their telephone. Um, as I said, we've got everyone on mute while, uh, while each presenter will be speaking and then we'll have some time for discussion a little later in our agenda. We are uh, streaming the session on YouTube Live. So that's on the Source Water Protection um, website. And so we just want to remind folks that it is part of the public record. Um, so when you've got your voice, it, it is being recorded. And if you've got your, your camera on, um, we'll see you there too. We're going to leave the, the YouTube live stream on the Source Water Protection website for a couple of weeks following, following the meeting. And, uh, and we'll just keep going from there. So Amitai, can you flip to the next one, please? Okay, so uh, the meeting purpose tonight, it's been a while since this group has met. I know some of you have, uh, have been in and out of meetings, but I also know many of you have been following along through meeting minutes and comments to uh, Martin and Sonia and team. So tonight is just to provide a refresh of the study process, the scope and who's involved. Um, and then the bulk of our time will be providing an overview of the threats and climate change assessment work that's been that's been done by the consulting team and uh, talk about policy approaches and we'll have some time for feedback and discussion on the on both elements so the threats and climate change assessments and the policy approaches and address as many questions as we can about the, the process uh, overall next slide please so just a refresh because we haven't seen each other for a while and we've got some people who are filling in for others. Um, just the roles and responsibilities for everybody who, who's part of the community liaison group. Um, the project team, so we'll be leading the tier three water, water budget and the project team are uh, Martin and Sonia from GRCA, um, Kyle and Colin, from Wellington and uh, Catherine is representing the, the ministry. There is a peer review team who've been involved and they're an external independent third party uh, peer review group. And they've looked at the technical findings at each of the major milestones. Then the project consulting team. So we have Jeff and Dave here from Matrix Solutions tonight. Um, and they have been doing um, the work on the threats assessment um, and they take direction from the project team. Next one, please. Uh, so community liaison group. So this is, this is you. Uh, the intent with the group is to provide a forum for the community to be informed about what's happening within the tier three study. Um, we'd like your input on the tier three water budget and its progress. And then uh, at the beginning, you all had a terms of reference and a code of conduct that just talked about how we'd work together uh, and abide by that terms of reference. The third party facilitator for this is Laura. So that means that we don't have an opinion um, about the study itself. Our job is to make sure that we have a good discussion, uh, that we chair the CLG meetings, um, that we provide the facilitation, and then we put together the meeting summary following, following the session um, and integrate your comments and, and questions that you may have. And then the general public is informed about the tier three water budget. They can provide input to the tier three water, water budget. And then they have been invited to observe CLG meetings. We've had members of the public come to our in-person meetings, which have been great. And I'm sure there's folks um, watching on YouTube uh, tonight. So welcome to, to the public members as well. Next one, please. So agenda, Jim, would you like to cover this? Sure. So hello, everyone. I'm Jim Fott, and uh, thank you for joining tonight, and thank you for those who are viewing on YouTube. So the introductions and welcome, we're pretty well through that, but I just wanted to go over the uh, agenda for this evening. We're going to follow just my remarks with uh, threat assessment and climate change assessment presentation. Following that, there will be a draft policy approaches presentation. And at 7.35, roughly, we will move into a discussion. And the best way to move through a discussion with a 
Zoom meeting like this is to go through the roster. So I have a roster of those who have joined and, and if there, uh, there's a couple others who haven't joined yet, if they join, they'll, I'll add them to the roster. What we're gonna do is uh, unmute your mic, I'll call on the names and we'll unmute your mic and you'll be able to make your points or questions or comments that you have. So because you know time is limited, we, we ask you to uh, at each uh, opportunity to go around the table, so to speak, on the roster call, just bring up one point or, or one comment or one question, and we can come back and go around again. You always have the opportunity to pass if you have nothing to add at that point, but we will come back around again. Um, you certainly can ask questions if something was unclear in the presentations and uh, seek clarification so you can uh, ask a question and then provide your comments if something wasn't clear. And from the terms of reference for the CAG, CLG, uh, we're asking for, uh, participants not to swear, no obscene and foul language, and uh, just not to make derogatory comments based on gender, race, uh, religion, sexual orientation, or disability. Uh, and the participants are all being managed by Amitai, and you'll be able to speak one at a time. And uh, we're wishing to make a comment. Uh, you'll be able to have your opportunity as we go around Right before we close, next steps and wrap up, Martin will provide that. And we are aiming to adjourn at 8.30. I'll turn it over to the next slide. Okay, great. Thanks, Jim. Just before I hand it off to uh, Martin, uh, Victor Shantora joined. Victor, would you like to just say a quick hello? You'll have to unmute. Unmute. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, wonderful. Vic Shantora. Uh, I'm uh, part of the citizen group. Um, unfortunately, I've moved out of the area, but I was very interested in the work as it was ongoing. And so I'd love to hear about uh, where you're at today and uh, the recommendations going forward. And I'm most certainly uh, interested in that and would welcome the opportunity to contribute to that when and where I can. So thank you very much and looking forward to hearing the the work as it's gone on to date. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Vic. Um, okay, so with that, uh, I think we've introduced everybody. Um, if others, we have a couple others who may join. So if they pop on, we'll introduce them when, when they're able to join us. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to Martin. Thank you, Susan. And yes, so I'm going to give you just a quick overview, kind of step back a little bit for those who are new. Um, just give a bit of a context of where we came from with the status of the project right now. So you can see here we've um, the tier three study has um, we've used this slide uh, all along since we started in 2016 in September. Um, so at each of those four milestones, we've we've had a, a community liaison group meeting, and it really was um, at those milestones that we were presenting the the kind of the, the results of that of of that step that that component of the, of the study. And we've, we've had, this is the fifth now, as I mentioned, and we've, so we've done, we've completed um, the kind of technical studies, uh, the technical components of the, uh, of the, of the study. Um, you can see here where we, where we came from and what we're not done yet, we've actually done additional technical work. And in the, on the next slide, um, if I can, Here we go. Now, um, you can see that um, just in a little bit of a different uh, format, you can see that we've we've done additional work um, after the completion of the technical tier three uh, proper. Um, and that is that we've done a preliminary water quantity threats analysis. That's uh, what you're going to hear um, from um, Matrix today, as well as a climate climate change assessment uh, study. So the results of those, that's the kind of bulk of, of, the, of the first part of, the, of our meeting tonight. And then later on, we're going to move into um, some policy development. Uh, we're going to provide a bit of a, uh, an overview of where we are uh, on developing the policies. As you, as you will recall and, and know that this is kind of, we, we're doing the technical studies and then we, we have to kind of assess, well, what now, what we need to do to, to address the, um, the challenges that, we, that we've, and the results that we've, we've uh, been given through the technical studies. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through that uh, in the second part. And it seems to be a quick delay if I, yeah, here we go. Here we go, yeah, sorry. Um, 
yeah, I'm using my arrows here. Um, so a little bit in terms of the process, uh, we've again used that slide a, a number of times. We've adopted it, uh, adopted it a little bit, uh, changed a little bit because uh, now that we've moved beyond the, the kind of proper tier three, um, there is no peer review, uh, provincial peer review, as was mentioned before, um, for those two technical studies. But uh, very similar to the before, we're using um, kind of a circular process. We're bringing draft reports, we're posting them, we're bringing them to the community liaison group as, as we do today. We will then have a two week uh, commenting period so people can, um, members of the CLG can comment and they'll provide, uh, will, uh, they can provide us with comments, written comments, obviously in addition to what you would like to say today. Um, and as Susan was mentioning before, the, the, the video on, on YouTube will be available for, for those two weeks. So if somebody wants to go back or, or, for, or for someone who, who may have missed uh, joining us tonight, they actually can go later on and, and, and watch the two hours um, with the additional information. Uh, we'll bring those comments back to the project team. Uh, we may discuss with our consultants with Matrix to figure out the responses. We'll, uh, we'll provide responses to the to the comments and questions um, that will be summarized in together with uh, with a meeting meeting summary and those things will be posted uh, on on the website and that will then kind of be wrapped up into a final final report that then goes uh, to the project team and eventually gets posted on the on this uh, source protection website as well so that's just in terms of the actual process that we're going through. We've done it for the last four meetings and we'll be doing the same uh, to, with this meeting as well. So um, you can expect a, a similar uh, format and similar process. And I think I'm just gonna move on to the next. Uh, seems to be slow, but here we go. Um, so just a little bit into the project timeline I mentioned before. So we're not quite, but almost uh, towards the towards the four-year mark. So we started in 2016 with the initiation of the of that project. Project, as you can see, we've uh, uh, took quite a bit of while to to collect data and to kind of characterize the uh, the, um, the, the geology and the hydrogeology, and then uh, went into model the model model development and actual risk assessment. And right now we're kind of, uh, as you can see, towards the uh, starting of 2020, uh, we've added the threats analysis and climate change uh, pieces to, to the technical components, and we've started to work on the policies. Um, so you'll hear from that to, uh, to, tonight as well. So just a little bit of an overview of where we come from and when we had those different uh, CLG meetings uh, in the past. And with that, um, I think I'm going to um, pass it back on over to uh, to Dave. Hopefully that worked. I just passed on the controls. We'll see if this works, Martin. I'll try it again here. Oh, I have, looks like I have control. Yes, I just granted your control, Dave. You should be able to. I did it. I flipped the screen from the slide forward. Oh, too many times. Yeah, that's a bit of a lag. You have to be careful not to press too many times. Okay. Okay, the arrow buttons work well. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks, Martin, and uh, thank, welcome everybody here tonight on uh, what appears to be the first day of spring. Um, so tonight I'm going to speak with everybody about the final tasks of the risk assessment um, work, including the threats ranking analysis and the climate change assessment. And um, you know, the purpose of the threats ranking assessment is to better understand how each group of, of the water quantity threats may affect groundwater levels at municipal wells. And the uh, purpose of the climate change assessment is similar. You know, as we want to, we, we, we set out to look at how climate change projections may affect the water supply for the municipality. Um, so to begin, I'm going to provide a little bit of a recap of the uh, of the tier three um, tier three assessment. So um, <clears throat> if we can recall back a number of months ago that the uh, tier three water quantity risk assessment was completed to 
to better understand how likely Center Wellington will be able to meet future water quantity demands from existing permitted wells. Um, again, I'll remind everybody here that the tier three assessment is only able to assess existing wells where we have scientifically tested and proven data. So we have to have wells that are tested. Um, the municipality has completed a current concurrent project called the Water Supply Master Plan, which identifies a number of new potential well locations to further explore meeting the long-term water supply demands. Um, so after the municipality sets forth with testing and drilling new wells at the locations, uh, those wells can be considered within the tier three assessment update at that time, once they've been properly assessed and are ready for permitting. Um, and, the, and the Water Supply Master Plan also looks at some additional additional pieces of the water supply component for example looking at the at the at at the maximum day yield and the capacity of the system and the and the tier three looks primarily looks at uh, average day water demands so the questions asked during the tier three assessment include you know can the current wells infrastructure supply enough water to meet the demands of the current population um, can it meet the demands of the projected population growth uh, through increased pumping rates? Is the current system reliable during a prolonged drought? And will it be reliable if we have increased development that may decrease groundwater recharge and supply to the system? Now, finally, if we increase pumping, um, how may the how what may be the effects on cold water streams and potentially significant significant wetlands? So the you know by and large the tier three um, project develops a computer model that to the best of our ability simulates groundwater flow and the water supply through the through the aquifer that the municipality pumps from. Um, the model's not perfect, but it's the best that we can do with the time and and uh, and budget and data that we that we have. So one of the ways that the that the tier three goes through its analysis is to consider a number of scenarios, um, and these scenarios are there to to evaluate the reliability of the current and future pumping the reliability of the system to meet current and future pumping rates under existing and future land use, and under average climate conditions and extended drought conditions. These scenarios are prescribed by the province of Ontario's technical rules, and they do apply to all tier three assessments completed within the province. Now, both for surface water intakes and groundwater wells. Some of the language is different for surface water intakes, um, but basically uh, the same types of analysis are completed. So Ontario's drinking water source protection legislation is designed around the, the whole idea that we can map areas where activities can occur within those areas that may that may have an effect on water quantity or water quality. Um, by, by producing a, a map of an area, the province and the municipality are able to rely on existing and revised planning tools to implement policies across the landscape to manage those threats. So when we, when we want to set forth and develop, you know, map something out um, for water quantity um, and for groundwater supplies, the area is called the WAPA queue. Um, if, you're, if you follow the water quality source protection work, then the, the, you know, the acronym WAPA stands for wellhead protection area. So the queue is added to WAPA to delineate quantity. Um, you know, it just occurred to me as I was preparing this afternoon that Q also stands for quality. So in this case, Q is there for quantity and the WAPA is the land area. Um, the WAPA Q is mapped out by calculating the area of groundwater in an aquifer that is drawn, draw down, drawn down above a threshold. In the case of Center Wellington, this drawdown threshold is two meters. Um, so it's the area that, um, that if you were to stop pumping within the municipality and if you were to, and, and other area, other users within the area then you might see a rebound um at two meters or more above that 
keeping in mind that you can't, we don't measure this whole WAPA Q area. Um, we can't measure it. And in this case, it's a conservative area. Um, and it and it doesn't imply that all the water takings within the area pose a threat to the municipality su water supply. It does. It's not meant to do that. It's meant to start as a first screening area map. From and once we have that screening area delineated, the next step in the work is to look within that at a subset of water takings to see if they pose any type of additional risk to municipal water supply. So I can, if you can recall the results that we that we um, presented, um, we did conclude that the current water su supply system can meet fu the future average day water demand until 2031 to 2036 period under average and drought climate conditions without impacts to the natural environment. And the reason why we have the range of 2031 to 2036 is there's a couple reasons for that. One is that you know future demand water demands aren't certain. The other reason is that that um, that the water supply master plan identified that the main limiting factor at this time to growth was having having extra extra high capacity to meet higher higher max day needs for the municipality. So the system the system can supply average day water supply longer. Um, but there is a need for additional municipal, municipal, municipal wells to supply shorter term bur bursts or peaks in, in water demand. Um, second conclusion is that the current well infrastructure capacity is insufficient to meet the 2041 average day demand um, that was established through the water supply master plan. And this, this results in a significant risk according to the province's technical rules. And since we have a significant risk, then the WAPA Q, the map that I just showed you, is also assigned a significant risk level. Um, and with that assignment, all groundwater takings and also potential reductions to groundwater recharge within that area are classified as significant water quantity threats. Um, I'll remind you, as I said before, that just because they're classified as significant water quantity threats, it doesn't imply that they will have an effect on, on the uh, municipal water supply. And the purpose of the work that I'm, that I'm gonna keep talking about next is the work that we do to see, well, what is really, how, how significant are those additional threats to water levels at the municipal water supply wells? I'm gonna take a little bit of a, a stop for a little sip of water here. So what the, as I just mentioned, um, it's important for us to identify which types of, of, of uses could have a real effect. Real, I mean, something that's measurable, something that's of significance at the locations of the municipal wells in order to develop pol effective policy that can make a difference um, a difference for the management of the municipal water supply. So we followed a couple of steps as part of the threats assessment that I'm going to tell you about. Um, the first, the first step was to estimate the relative impact that each type of groundwater taking or land use change might have on groundwater levels, and we used the computer model to do that. Um, the second step was to use to broadly use the insights that we've developed. Um, so we take modeling results and we try to understand them more qualitatively in order to make, to present advice to the source protection authority and the municipality on what the appropriate policies might be to mitigate the current and future water quantity threats. So if, 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 if we set out and do this work and we find out that a specific type of water quantity threat has no, has no to negligible impact to to um, to uh, what the water supply wells, um, we wouldn't have the same priority of managing that threat as we would others that would have it that that could have a measurable impact to, to the wells. So further on our approach, I've talked about how we categorize categorize our threats. 
And the um, when we do this analysis, we analyze each scenario by turning off and turning on each category of threats in the model. And then we then just evaluate what the effect of, of that scenario is on the water levels at the municipal wells. Um, we do compare the changes in water levels for each scenario to safe the safe operating water levels that we used in the tier three to, to develop an understanding of how sensitive those threats may be. Um, there's a good question brought up by uh, Jan Beveridge this week, and she submitted it to, to the Source Protection Authority relating to the fact that some water levels at municipal wells were quite low in 2019. And, and she inferred that the drawdown during the scenarios would be, um, would draw the water level lower than the safe operating levels that were established. Um, I, I, we're going to respond, Jan, to your comments in, in greater detail. Um, and uh, because, because there's quite a, lo quite a lot of data there. Um, the way the data has been, tr tr has been, uh, has been uh, communicated and analyzed is 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 somewhat tricky, and uh, we want to make sure that um, you know, for example, the, those water levels in 2019, um, they could have been drawn down to lower levels for a variety of reasons over short term. It doesn't make the original assumptions that we have incorrect, but I think we just want to look at that to address your comments as, as well as we can. So we talked about, you know, how do we analyze the scenarios? Um, and, uh, and this figure here does illustrate kind of what I mean. So this picture, if you, if you will, a pumping well in a, in a um, into a bedrock aquifer and the light blue line up on, on top may illustrate the water level in the ground under non-pumping or lower pumping additions. The darker um, line illustrates the water level as you pump the well harder. And the orange line illustrates the safe operating water level. So if you if you pump too hard and the water level comes below that safe operating level, um, there could be reasons due to the location of the pump or water quality or other reasons where that that uh, that would not be a sustainable situation for that well. So what are the results? Well, we we had uh, the first result that we that we uh, that we came up with is that you know, the largest influence on future groundwater levels is from increased municipal pumping to meet population growth. So by and large, the greatest um, stressor on 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 the aquifer in and around Fergus and Alora in the center of Center Wellington is due to increased pumping. And that range as we came from, from the work is, you know, between 1.5, between about one and a half or two to 24 meters of incremental drawdown within the aquifer. Um, when, it, when we looked at other types of threats, the next type of threat was unserviced domestic water well pumping. And the effect of unserviced domestic water well pumping on the aquifer is, is relatively minimal. So, um, those domestic water wells in total in aggregate, you know, maybe have somewhere between 0 0.1 to 0 0.4 meters of effect of drawdown in the municipal aquifer. That's kind of in the area that it's, um, it might be within a measurable area, but it's kind of not likely something that you would be able to measure in the field, but it's, it's something, it's something on, on the, uh, on the low, in the low end side. Uh, the next piece that we evaluated was what are the, what's the effect of land development? So we evaluated the land development scenario by, by first of all, assuming that all land development brought in totally impervious development. So it stopped, it stopped all recharge um, within impervious areas. So parking lots, rooftops, roads. Um, reality, all, all developments now incorporate some level of water management controls that return a fair bit of water to the subsurface and maintain pre-development groundwater recharge. But in the absence of that, um, 
we look at a 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 meters of aquifer drawdown because of uncontrolled land development. Um, the next category of, of that we looked at was really to look at what do those what do those existing permitted but non-municipal takings have on the water supply aquifer, and at present, um, most of the permitted non-municipal takings aren't located close to the municipality, and therefore they don't really have a very significant impact on drawdown. So we're talking about five centimeters to ten centimeters of of, of aquifer drawdown. Um, there's a caveat there that if large permits were to be established closer to the municipality, then they then there's always a potential for them to have a more of a significant impact on water levels. And the way that we typically evaluate those are to are, are to complete a pumping test, complete an analysis, and look at those on a case by case basis. Uh, finally, the effect of livestock watering on the water supply aquifer is uh, very minimal, less than five centimeters in total. Okay, I'm gonna now I'm gonna I'm gonna move on into uh, a presentation on the climate change assessment. This is gonna be a, a very brief brief presentation on on what is actually a very important and complex to topic. So if you haven't already, I urge you to read the report that has a more of a detailed description, and hopefully will provide you enough of a summary here that we'll be able to uh, instigate some more conversation. So our objective in completing the climate change assessment is to evaluate the potential effects of climate change on groundwater levels in the municipal wells. And it's a really important, it's a really important question. It's climate change is on everyone's mind a lot of the time. And uh, so most of us are aware that there's a growing level of evidence and agreement in the scientific community that climate change is real and is something that we and our governments need to understand and mitigate. 2019 was the warmest year on record with the average temperature uh, being more than one degree Celsius above the pre-industrial average. And I was just reading earlier that the first first quarter, first four months of of uh, of 2020 have, have us on a path to 2020, maybe the hottest year on record. So it's it's uh, the trend is going up and it's not just a, an anomaly. Um, and uh, so I'm going to I'm going to just make things a bit more complicated here for a minute. But when you look at, um, we all know that when it gets hotter in the summertime, it gets humid, the air, air holds holds more moisture. And uh, that's 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 a thermodyn thermodyn thermodynamic effect of, of heat storage in the air. Um, so with every, every degree Celsius of warming of the atmosphere, the global water vapor can increase by seven percent so as we increase temperature of of the atmosphere by one or two degrees the atmosphere can store more and more and more water once we put more and more and more water in the atmosphere um this translates that that water what you know what goes in what goes out so we'll have typically um the science tells us that we will uh, have an increase in energy stored with that water being in the atmosphere and when that happens, we'll have an increase in frequency and the magnitude of precipitation and storm events. The uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it's also called the IPCC, is an international assembly of the best climate scientists from across the globe. In 2014, the IPCC released its fifth assessment report which made its best predictions of future climate change based on the best available science at that time. The sixth assessment report is expected next year. So the fifth assessment report introduced the concept of representative concentration pathways or RCPs. Each RCP represents a specific scenario of carbon emissions and greenhouse gas concentrations. Um, and this chart here shows a combination of, of, many, of the many, many different scenarios that were that were considered by climate scientists throughout the, throughout the uh, of the earth that were contributing to the IPCC's fifth report and uh, the highest greenhouse gas concentrations are shown by those uh, lines in red and the dark red the thickest line 
is is been given a name, the RCP 8.5, and that represent just represents all of the pathways with the highest concentrations. The modeling work that we do and the scenarios that we consider for climate are based on the RCP 8.5 scenario, so that we can we can go back and say we're really looking at worst case climate change projections. Um, the domain that uh, Jeff Melchin and I focus in quite a bit is groundwater flow models. Um, global climate models are, I'd say they're kind of similar. They, they're the primary tool for looking at climate impact assessment. Um, they, when they're developed, they discretize the, all of the Earth's surface um, into a three-dimensional grid matrix that covers off the atmosphere, oceans, and land surfaces. Um, the models account for the movement and transformation of moisture compound and uh, across air and land. Uh, and they typically simulate patterns continuously over simulation periods of up to 250 years. So they go back in time about 100 years, match historical observations, and they go forward in time another 100, 150 years. Um, today's GCMs are the culmination of over 40 years of research and development. and uh, they continue to be developed over time. And uh, there's another type of model, what's called a regional climate model. And a regional climate model would be an example where you focus on a region such as North America and you dice up the North American land even smaller than a global climate model, but you tie that regional climate model into a global model so that it behaves, it behaves kind of the same way. So what do these regional climate model tells us, tells us, what do they tell us? This, this map illustrates the projected mean annual temperature change in Canada for the 2050s, 2050s period. Um, and this map represents really an average of all of the GCMs uh, together. Um, and uh, it's interesting, we've all heard how Canada's Arctic is extremely vulnerable to climate change and we're monitoring that over time. This is echoed by the simulations here, which show that um, we would expect a, up to up to a five five centigrade uh, centigrade increase in average annual temperature in the Arctic. Um, in southern Ontario, we're not looking at quite as significant of a temperature increase in the 2050s, possibly on average on a three degrees Celsius. Um, three degrees Celsius doesn't seem like much, but um, on a really hot day that might be 35 degrees Celsius in Southern Ontario, that might be a 38 Celsius, which is an extremely hot day. Um, also, if you think of a, of a month like January, where January is off or December, which is often sitting at, at, at an average temperature of minus one, minus two, that translates to an average temperature of plus one, plus two. So times that we may have a lot more snowfall activity would, would turn into a lot more rain. The climate models also predict changes in temperature, sorry, in precipitation. Um, so recall when, it, when I talked about the fact that warmer air is able to store more water. Um, in the Arctic and Northern Ontario, if we don't have ice across all the water bodies, there's a great source of, of water and evaporation. So if warmer air will store a lot more water and that's why the projected precipitation changes are much higher in the North. Um, Southern Ontario, we're still looking at projection, projections of average precipitation on the order of five degrees and some say more, sorry, 5%. And uh, when you move into arid climates, such as Australia, Southern US and Africa, those areas don't have sources of water and those areas tend to go into a bit more of a, a lot more extreme drying, drying situation under the climate change scenarios. I mentioned how there are a number of different global climate models. Uh, this figure here shows us in gray um, a lot of the RCP 8.5 models that are available. And uh, it's, there's just too many models than we really would like to, to simulate. And so what we do is we have a method to pick out a subset of those models shown, shown in orange 
and we use those models to represent um, the entire range of variability that we see across all of the models and we pick them to model further. So this figure shows us those orange squares. And uh, so th the orange squares, they, they cover off a range of temperature change of about two degrees Celsius. And they also carry off a, ra a range of precipitation increase of around 14 degrees Celsius. So while I mentioned previously that Southern Ontario might have a three degrees increase in temperature and you know five to seven degree percent increase in precipitation, there is a wide range of uncertainty of what that might actually be. And when we want to look at something such as the effects on water resources, we want to uh, um, understand what that range of variability might be so that we can really plan for uh, what might be the cases that we should develop, develop management plans for. What we do now is we take those, um, we take those global climate models and we, we develop data sets of, of temperature and precipitation and to input into the hydrology model that we used for this tier three. And if you recall from the tier three work, we use a hydrology model to estimate groundwater recharge rates across the landscape. And this figure illustrates for us, um, so, so forgive me, the circles that are on here are meant to pop up as animation, but if we can, if you think, if you can kind of remove them from your eyes for a second, the black line across this, across this chart illustrates the average monthly groundwater, groundwater recharge under current conditions. The colored lines and the gray lines represent average monthly recharge rates for each of the future global, uh, future climate scenarios. And this gives us a little bit of a trend that we can talk about. Um, in the winter time here, you know, months one through four is uh, really is uh, is uh, January is the w winter and early springtime months, and uh, similarly in uh, in December, we have we're actually predicting much higher groundwater recharge rates uh, than under current conditions, and the primary reason for that is that. It's warmer during those periods of time. There's less frozen soil. Um, there's there's additional precipitation, and and that precipitation falls as rainfall often and not snow. So those soils are wet, and when there's an opportunity, that results in much higher groundwater recharge rates. In the summertime, and it's hard, it's really hard to see from this figure, but in the summertime, the groundwater recharge rates are typically a little bit lower than under current conditions. So we have, certainly we'll have drought conditions, certainly we'll have dry soils, um, but the average volume of water that goes, is available for groundwater recharge doesn't really, doesn't really get impacted all that much. And, and the rest of the fall and springtime conditions are just about the same. So the net impact of this situation is that um, annual groundwater recharge rates may be approximately 10% higher or more under future climate conditions. Once we have those recharge rates assembled, um, we can import them into the groundwater flow model again. So if you recall that groundwater flow model is a detailed model of the, not just the municipal wells, but of the landscape and the areas that produce groundwater recharge that flow to them. And we can adjust, we can come up with a scenario that illustrates each of those, what happens for each of those diff different types of scenarios. And once we have the modeling done, we can predict well what happens to water levels. And this figure here shows us a map again of of simulated water levels at well E1. And the black line is, is the well E1 water levels under average current conditions. And the colored lines on top are different climate change scenarios. For all of those climate change scenarios, the groundwater levels increase, and they increase up to, up to 30 centimeters or more as a maximum. Um, 30 centimeters is, is, quite a, is a, quite an increase. And if you recall, that's approximately, um, the amount, you know, the amount that we're looking at um, that might be related to, for example, something like the domestic well usage. 
So it's um, it's important that when we look at climate change that we consider multiple scenarios. As we see in this situation, um, all the scenarios illustrate groundwater levels going up, which is a positive thing when you can when you want to assess the reliability of the water supply. Other areas that rely, for example, more on shallow groundwater, um, shallow groundwater um, may be more affected by um, higher, by reduced summertime groundwater recharge rates. And there may be some cases where groundwater levels go up, but for the deeper at water supply aquifer in center Wellington, groundwater levels go up. And the next, I'm gonna talk for a second about about leakage. So if you recall from the, you know, the water balance um, that we illustrated for the area, we looked at how much water, now again, it's an estimate, but how much water leaks from shallow bedrock downwards into the water supply aquifer. Um, and this figure shows, again, the black line is the current leakage rate. So somewhere between around 11,800 cubic meters per day of water leak into the lower aquifer. Um, there's an you know, additional four to 500, a maximum additional of four to 500 cubic meters per water that, that will leak downwards because there's more water available from groundwater recharge. So in terms of the, uh, what did we learn from the, um, from the climate change assessment? We learned that groundwater recharge rates are predicted to increase during the winter and early spring months, a decrease in the summertime, but the net, but the only, but the net total change to volume is, you know, maybe on the order of 10% or more. Uh, that, that results in an increase in, um, the model to climate uh, increase in water levels for the model of climate scenarios and an increase in in leakage to the aquifer um, so we don't see any risk any additional risk to the municipal groundwater supply at the, to the 2050 time horizon and uh, i'm almost done here but i'm going to summarize some of the implications from both the threats assessment um, and the climate change work that are used by this horse protection authority and the municipality for policy development. And um, the first, the first <laughs> key finding is that since municipal water takings are the most significant, have the most significant effect on water levels, the municipality needs to have a focus on the management and optimization of, of those water takings, um, which we know, we know that from the water supply master plan that um, that the efforts needed to decrease future demand are most important and the efforts needed to increase future supply are also very important. We, need, we always need to assess potential inter interference from municipal wells um, when, we, when we wanna mitigate impacts, uh, particularly from, from new and expanded non-municipal takings. So every time that, you know, if we have, if we have an application or a permit from a non-municipal water user, uh, we have the tools to evaluate whether or not there's going to be a significant impact. Um, we would carry that through and, and work with and work with the province through the permit to take water work um, and through the applicants <coughs> to to evaluate that. Um, even though there's not a significant impact of groundwater recharge reductions, it's really important to maintain groundwater recharge, not only to supply to continue supplying the water supply aquifer, but to um, but to keep local ecological conditions functioning. Um, and, uh, you know, other implications for policy development are that model maintenance and uh, maintaining monitor monitoring programs are extremely important. New data is collected over time, all the time, and we improve our, our, our understanding all the time. And finally, um, that, uh, that there's no climate change risk predicted to the municipal um, groundwater supply based on the current uh, understanding of the system. So thank you, thank everybody. I am done my uh, my presentation here on on just in the nick of time. So I'm going to pass on control to to Martin. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Oops.
Okay. <laughs> Sorry, one, one moment, Martin. Uh, okay. it's, it's not letting me uh, click approve, just one second. Right, Martin, please uh, request again. Okay. Okay, now you should be able to go ahead. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Okay. So I will just, uh, for a couple of slides, well, one of them is just a title slide, um, talk about some of the context for uh, policy approaches. And um, seems to be, yes, here we go. So You've just heard from Dave in terms of what we, and if you even go back to some of the earlier community, uh, community liaison group meetings, what we've learned over those three and a half years now. So we we know essentially where we need to manage the water. We have a WAPA queue. We have a lot of the insights from the technical study with regards to what is driving the risk. Um, it's not just generally in terms of the water quality, but we've just heard in terms of, you know, the municipal takings, we know in terms of what agricultural takings or recharge, the, you know, the, the, the various different risks to associated to some of those different uses and, and users in terms of water. And we've just, re, uh, just before heard some of the technical implications in terms of an insight on what could be looked at in terms of policy development. So we have pretty much all the technical information available to us now to kind of move forward and figuring out what we need to do, uh, do about this. So under the Clean Water Act, it's the responsibility of the Source Protection Committee to develop those policies to address the significant risk level and, and identify policies that meet the kind of objectives of the Clean Water Act to essentially uh, make those significant threats go away or, or prevent them from from coming uh, into being kind of thing. And we, you know, we have to look at the both consumptive water takings and the re recharge reduction. Those are the two prescribed drinking water threats that are under the, under the act. Uh, we need to look at existing and future water takings. Um, and so we, we, we have both an, um, looking at what can be done now, but we're also looking at what can we do to prevent things from um, either getting worse or, or making sure it doesn't get uh, or gets better than in, in the future. Uh, what we've done in uh, Lake Erie specifically is to uh, delegate source protection, uh, sorry, policy development um, and specifically the early stages of it uh, to uh, project teams in many cases. And for Center Wellington uh, and for other tier threes, that's been the case as well. Um, and the reason being is that in the project team, we can incorporate and we have uh, those agencies involved that really need to then carry out the, and implement some of the policies. So really the principle is to have those that need to implement things uh, be part of the involvement and the development of the policies. And in this case, obviously municipalities with Center Wellington and Wellington County, as well as the ministry um, in terms of the, you know, permit to take water programs that we will hear later on. Um, so, We'll get later on, I'll talk a little bit about the process after um, after this meeting and, and coming up, but uh, ultimately it'll be the project team to recommend uh, policies that will go to the Source Protection Committee. And they'll be drafted at the beginning and then they'll be revised and, and eventually through the process they'll be uh, incorporated into a plan and, and submitted to the province. And I'll talk about a little more, but we're right now at the very first uh, step of those uh, policy development. So policy approaches, as we call it, um, and it's really a representation of a, a high level overview uh, of what it is allowed under the Clean Water Act and giving us, you know, laying out the cards, what's allowed, what can we do, and then some of the considerations that we're starting to look at. Um, we're looking into what others have done. Um, we're kind of one of the two last tier threes in the province. Uh, we're kind of catching up on, on, on trying to get things completed, but on, on the other hand, uh, it's kind of an advantage because we can look at other uh, other areas in the province, what they've done. Some of those policies have already been approved by the province. Uh, so we're not starting from scratch. We can kind of look at what others have uh, developed as well. Um, so that's just a, a little bit of a kind of context. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Kyle Davis. He's going to uh, run you through the, the, the work that we've done 
so far in terms of those policy approaches. And I'll, I'll come back with a bit of an overview in terms of next steps and, uh, and where to from here. So I'm gonna... Um, Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Martin. Um, I think I've got control of the screen now. Perfect. I do, maybe. There we go. Okay, great. So I'm one of the staff uh, that's uh, on the project team that uh, develop that's developing policies, as well as was on the, the coordinating for um, the coordinating for the technical uh, studies as well. So my uh, responsibilities uh, extend across the county, and we we always like to start my my talks with a bit of a county context. So um, in terms of Wellington County. We do have four WAPA queues uh, within the county, Center Wellington being one of them, and you can see it there uh, on the uh, left-hand side of the screen. And then there are also being, there's also two in Erin, uh, Georgetown and Acton, coming from our neighbors in Halton Hills. And then there's the Guelph, Guelph Aramosa uh, WAPA queue as well. And so this is important just to, to point out a couple things on this, on this map. The hatched areas are draft and not currently in legal effect, where the solid uh, purple or pink, depending on how you see that color, is, is in legal effect. So right now, and then the green line is the watershed boundary. So the source protection plans are divided up by watershed boundaries. So we have um, a series of policies in the credit, in the CTC uh, source protection plan that apply to the majority of this approved local queue in Erin. However, there is a little bit of a sliver uh, that's in the grant. And then we have, the two, the, the draft uh, local queues in the grand where we're working on the policies right now. Now, for a variety of reasons, our focus on policy development currently is on the center Wellington draft local queue that you see here, and this little sliver of, uh, of the acting local queue that comes into Erin. And the next slides will just give you a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a zoomed in view of that. So the center Wellington local queue, as uh, Dave walked through, uh, is predominantly within the township of center Wellington. However, there is a portion that extends into Mapleton, and then there's also a small portion that extends into the township of Woolwich in the region of Waterloo. Now, in the Grand River Source Protection Plan, um, the policies are actually divided up by, by upper tier municipality, so it's municipal chapters. So the policies that we're writing right now is for the, are for the Wellington County chapter, and that would be the center Wellington portion of this WOPA queue and the Mapleton portion of this WOPA queue. Um, the little the portion in, of Woolwich would be covered by the region of Waterloo uh, chapter That's uh, at some future point. And then at the same time, we are looking at, uh, looking at including policies that would cover this portion of the Acton Wilpa queue that comes into the Grand, River, uh, the Grand River watershed. So again, that green line is the watershed boundary. And the majority, majority of the Georgetown and Acton Wilpa queues are fully contained within the CTC source protection plan and already actually have approved policies in place. So this is, this is important uh, to note just because one of, one of the considerations that we look at is uh, consistency within the county and consistency with neighboring source protection plan, plan policies, which we do have approved ones already in the CTC. So moving along, uh, you've seen this uh, diagram already. So where we're, where we're at in the process at this point is we're talking about the policy development, the policies approaches. Um, we did put this back in here just to reinforce that link that the, and Dave mentioned this too, that the key findings of technical studies, especially the uh, water quality threats analysis and the climate change assessment actually feed in and uh, are one consideration that we, that we uh, that we consider or, um, when we are developing policies. Another, another tool that we use is actually a discussion paper, and I'll talk about that in the next slides, um, that, that help, help us in drafting, drafting the policies. And I will end this, we'll end this presentation with a more detailed kind of timeline going forward on where, where things are, are going kind of on the, off, off the uh, end of this arrow. Move the cursor. There we go. Okay, so what is a discussion paper? So the discussion paper is an approach that the Lake Erie Source Protection Region, uh, the Grand River Source Protection Plan, has used uh, many times in the past uh, for both quantity and quality. So a discussion paper general is a you know a, a general review or a jurisdictional review uh, that provides policymakers on background information on technical studies, threats, existing legislation, policies, and programs 
and kind of it does a review of the policy tools and approaches. So as I mentioned, the Lake Erie, this is a common approach that Lake Erie has taken in the past. Uh, so they, they did that for the quality uh, threats a number of years ago. And the quantity discussion paper, the water quantity, was actually written in 2018. And that was for the Guelph, Guelph, Aramosa tier three study. And therefore, we just wanted to note that some of the appendices in that discussion paper are rather specific to the Guelph, Guelph, Aramosa study, but there are general concepts that we've carried forward into our considerations while developing policy. And one of the things that the discussion paper walks through is existing legislation. And there are, as, as many of you are aware, there are, there are a, a kind of a nested framework of uh, water uh, regulations uh, in, in the country, really, starting with the federal, uh, the, the federal acts um, and then moving into the provincial acts. And obviously, predominantly, we're interested in the Clean Water Act, but there, is, there are links, as we'll talk about in the next slide, between the Clean Water Act and some of these other provincial acts, the water, Ontario Water Resources Act, the Planning Act, um, as well as the Environmental Assessment Act. And then finally, the municipalities have uh, tools and legislation and, and uh, programs available to them, including things like the Water Supply Master Plan, uh, Growth Management Strategy, and of course, the planning documents, the county and the local official plans. So this is a diagram that we had provided uh, in previous uh, community liaison groups. And we wanted to bring it back today just because it, it really emphasizes and shows and, and shows well the interconnectedness of the different um, parts of the water management regulatory process. So you can see in the center, the source protection SP quantity, um, honeycomb there, and then it's linked or, or abuts next to a number of other uh, parts or a number of other processes. So we've talked today already with the Water Supply Master Plan. Those two are, are very closely linked. There's of course the Planning Act and then the Class, class EA, which feeds into the Water Supply Master Plan, especially when, when uh, new wells have been identified. There's the permit to take water process, which is under the Ontario Water Resources Act and deals with, with uh, water takings, not only for municipal takings, but also for, uh, also for um, private takings. And then, of course, there's the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is the primary piece of legislation that uh, oversees the operation and the provision of safe drinking water for the municipality. All of these are connected. And then, and then over on, on the left-hand side, you get into the private wells and the contaminated sites and the quality, uh, which is a whole other aspect of the source protection program, but, but really not our focus today uh, and for this meeting, which is more, more on the quantity side. So... All of, these, all of these different regulatory processes are interconnected and there's linkages between them. And an important piece uh, that comes out, especially from the Safe Drinking Water Act, but applies really to all of these is continuous improvement. So these studies, the tier three, the Water Supply Master Plan are point in time studies and they certainly, they certainly, they're done in a certain period of time and they certainly look ahead, but they, they are designed to be updated as, as time goes on. And that, uh, that meshes and dovetails very nicely with the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is actually embedded in a quality management or continuous improvement uh, me mentality. For the rest of tonight though, we're gonna talk about the Clean Water Act and, and that is really the focus of our policy development. Uh, so we, we, focus in, we, fo we focus in on the Clean Water Act and on the Clean Water Act tools. And so this is, the, this is just the initial summary, just to provide you with an overview of what I'll be talking about. And I'll go into each of these tools in a little bit more detail as we, uh, as we go along. So for provincial regulatory approvals, prescribed instruments, permits to take water being the predom predominant one, although there are others, environmental compliance approvals for recharge, land use planning, education outreach, stewardship programs, spe specify actions, and then the Clean Water Act specifies under part four, three separate other tools, prohibition risk management plans and restricted land use. So this is the full toolbox that's available to policymakers uh, when we're looking at what policies are best to, uh, to use when, uh, when drafting water quantity or water quality policies. So the next, two, the next three slides are around consumptive water takings. Um, so we break it out into the, when we're writing policies, we break it out into the two different threats. So the, the first threat is the consumptive water taking uh, and prescribed instruments. 
land use planning and education outreach. The prescribed instruments is a is a is a primary or a key tool that is that is used, and we'll talk a little bit about existing sor uh, source protection plans and existing uh, uh, policies for quantity. Um, but the prescribed instruments, because the province can be directed under the source protection plan policies to review or amend the permit take water, take into consideration uh, tier three uh, results of the tier three, and 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 and. And sorry, and provided and provide additional conditions in the permit shape water. Land use uh, planning. Um, so again, this is uh, an area that we're we're looking at closely when we're looking at the policies. And so this can be either through the official plans, it can be through studies, it can be through through the by, through bylaws. And the source protection plan policies can direct those documents uh, to provide ad, um, additional study requirements or to provide additional uh, information. Education and outreach is uh, sort of one of our, our staple tools. You'll see that for almost all the threats, um, whether there be quality or quantity. And in a lot of cases, there is existing education and outreach um, uh, measures, but the policies build on that and encourage municipalities or direct municipalities in some cases to, to uh, implement those programs. Specify action for water quantity in particular. There's there's a variety, a wide variety that could be considered, and, and there's a number uh, identified here on the screen for you. So this ties into um, it's a, a link to water uh, education. It ties into the water management or the water conservation plans. Um, there's also links to jointly managing um, the the water resource. So you saw from that honeycomb slide that all the interconnections. All the linkages between the different pieces of legislation and the different agencies. So there, there can be uh, policies that you know direct agencies to continue to work together or establish processes and, and protocols for that. The uh, use and the maintenance of the tier three model. So again, the tier three model is uh, set up and funded and and has been set up and used specifically at, at this point in time. Um, however, as circumstances change whether that be new municipal wells or, or something else, then there may be a need to update that tier three model and to then use it again on updates to watch the master plan and things, things of that nature. And then also looking at priority of use concepts. Um, so that's uh, looking at the uh, prioritization or you know, prioritization of municipal or domestic or agricultural uses before allocating water to other uses. Uh, and that can also be something that can be looked at under the source protection plan policies. The other is a bit of a catch-all. Um, talked about quite a few of uh, quite a few of those, and, and ties in actually quite well to the Water Supply Master Plan uh, recommendations around water conservation. And then under the Clean Water Act, there are new authorities. Um, they're they're not that that new now, but um, but they have um, they're new in the sense of water quantity because they have not been used uh, very much, uh, if at all, yet. So there is the ability um, under the Clean Water Act to prohibit certain activities in certain areas to require risk management plans, and that would be in above and beyond other prescribed instruments. Um, and then tied to that is a restricted land use policy that allows you to um, tie into the development and the building permit review process. Now it's very important to note that these authorities are only really supposed to be used where the existing regulatory tools um, aren't sufficient or there's some gaps in, in, in the regulatory tools. They're not supposed to duplicate existing regulatory uh, authorities. Uh, so for instance, you have a permit take water process that's already very well established in Ontario. So now switching gears to recharge, recharge reduction, which is the other threat. Um, and again, it's you're going to see the same the same tools: prescribed instruments, land use planning, and education outreach. There are some different prescribed instruments in this case. This is environmental compliance approvals for stormwater infiltration projects. Um, that that the, those can be uh, amended to add conditions to encourage recharge of, of water where needed. You do have to balance that, uh, especially in an area like Center Wellington, with um, with uh, issues or concerns around chloride or road salt infiltration. So you, you do have to sort of balance the need for recharge, um, increasing recharge with 
uh, protecting the, of the quality of the groundwater through, uh, through road salt uh, or pre preventing road salt infiltration. And again, we talked about land use and education for consumptive and they can also be used for recharge reduction. And similarly, the, the toolboxes are, are the same there for, for recharge reduction. Um, the other are the specify actions, water management tools or joint water management structures with, with other agencies to maximize recharge, uh, producing low impact development guidelines and stewardship best management practices, disconnection of down spouts, incentive programs, things of that nature. And again, the part four toolbox is available for recharge reduction as well. Uh, this has been used a little bit more uh, in, uh, in other source protection plans in regards to risk management plans, but still not used widely uh, where, where a lot of the water quantity uh, um, policies are resting on some of the other tools. And just to provide you some context uh, from approved source protection plans. So there's a number of source protection plans that have already been approved. We've mentioned, um, we mentioned the CTC, uh, Halton Hamilton is another one. And uh, there's, the, there's a few others in the province that have approved water quantity source protection plan policies. Uh, others are in draft like Brent. Um, so the key here is no duplication um, or so permits to take water is a very common, um, a very common tool that you've seen. Common, common policies directing ministry to manage waters that are significant. Uh, water takings are significant threat, um, and the preference really is to use these prescribed instruments uh, where wherever possible. Okay, sorry, that's okay. Growth and development policies. Um, so policy is focusing on earlier or stronger contemplation of water select considerations and growth and development planning. This is fairly wide ranging and, and you, can, you can get into a, a couple different uh, different avenues here. Um, one, one avenue here that you see below in the first bullet is uh, the consideration of water uh, resource availability and provincial growth forecasting and the municipal planning process, um, as well as new development maintaining existing groundwater recharge rates. Now, this is where the technical studies that Dave talked about do help us kind of determine the best tool to use for Center Wellington and for, and for the county. Um, but there are a number of, uh, a number of uh, different options here that we can see from approved source protection plans. And then spe specify action or specific action. Um, so again, we're seeing the water conservation, we're seeing the municipal water supply management, optimization of municipal supplies, the municipal planning process, links to the water supply master plan in these approved source protection plan policies. One thing we haven't talked too much about uh, is monitoring. We do see monitoring policies, both groundwater and surface water uh, to support future updates and to best manage the resource. And then again, the information, uh, information sharing and the, um, and the funding uh, piece of it. So overall, there's a number of considerations that, that we as a project team take in, in, uh, take in as we're writing policies and looking at policy approaches. The technical results is, is, a, key, uh, is a key part of that. Uh, so those key findings and insights, uh, a key finding slide that Dave showed, you know, really does help us guide policies, both policies that we need to be writing and policies that maybe aren't as, as necessary uh, in this case to write. Existing regulations, existing uh, regulatory instruments are preferred. We look to avoid duplication of regulatory burden where, wherever possible. Uh, and prohibition generally is a, is a tool of last resort. So it is available under, the, under Section 57 of the Clean Water Act, but it is generally viewed both by the ministry um, and when you look at the countywide in terms of, uh, terms of the policies as a, as a tool of last, uh, last resort. One other uh, consideration, next consideration that we can uh, look at is consistency within the approved source protection plan. So this is actually within chapters of the Lake Erie or, or uh, region in the Grand River plan. So we do look for some consistency where possible, at least in consistency of approach, not necessarily policy text, but at least consistency of approach. Uh, we, and we also look, and it's a bullet couple, couple down, consistency with neighboring source protection plan chapters. And that is critical uh, or important consideration for us given that the WAPAQ does uh, extend in Acton over two watershed boundaries. And then we also look at precedents of approach uh, used that have been approved already by the province. And that's, uh, and we've gone over that in the, in the previous slide. 
Overall, the policy suite will really look to address the problem in a multi-pronged approach, kind of working on existing partnerships and looking to, uh, to, to better, uh, better improve the management of the, of, the, of, of the water resource where possible. And I'll now switch this over to Martin just to wrap us up. Thank you. Go. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I know we're a little bit behind schedule, but um, we have, have a couple of slides and then we're ready for questions, I think. Um, so I always have trouble. Yes, here we go. So just to kind of wrap it up in terms of um, I'm going to move into next steps and just kind of provide a little bit more context in terms of how we move forward. Um, there is a commitment from the Lake Erie region to, to kind of continue with the collaborative process for policy development. We've started with, uh, you know, we have a multi-stakeholder committee that's obviously legislated, but then through the project team uh, with our engagement in terms of a community liaison group, with our stakeholders, with municipalities, we're really trying to work through and, and figure out how we can best uh, come up with solutions that work. Um, so. There's a lot of consideration and that's what we just talked about. They include all the conclusions, they include all the conclusions and recommendations from the technical studies. So we're trying to really bring those in. Um, Kyle just talked about some of the precedents of other source protection plans. Obviously through the, through the process, we're gonna be hearing from municipalities, from conservation authority staff and provincial reviewers. And so, and also, you know, through the engagement of, the, of, of this group, CLG, and we'll take all those considerations into account. Ultimately, um, one of the next steps will be to have draft policies. Uh, they'll be uh, then presented to the CLG for feedback, and they'll be also presented to the, uh, to the municipal councils for their information. And then the project team will, uh, will recommend those draft policies to the, to the committee. And uh, they'll uh, uh, ultimately will be endorsing them and uh, releasing them for pre and public consultation. And they'll go through the process of of getting them into a plan and submitting it to the province. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm just going to move on to a bit of a um, slide in, on, on timelines. So as I mentioned earlier, we're early in the process, uh, policy approaches. I've uh, kind of summarized the, the entire almost four years into one of those segments here, the last four years in, in terms of completing all the technical work. Right now we're in May of 2020. Uh, we're presenting the policy approaches to, to you tonight. And uh, we're going to move on with, ultimately, we're going to have the draft policies uh, to the committee. We'll have revised policies. Uh, we'll have moving to a pre-consultation period where municipalities and ministries can provide formal comments back to the Source Protection Authority and the committee on, on those uh, revised uh, uh, policies. And then once that process is complete, we'll move into a formal public consultation period where the, the public can has, has uh, opportunities to, to formally comment on those before they're gonna get um, considered. And then uh, we'll have a final plan that can get submitted to the ministry. So you can see overall, we'll, like we're from May to, to spring, if we can meet all those timelines, um, it takes about a year um, from, from now to, to when it's gonna be submitted. All along the way, there's opportunities for uh, revisions uh, from the various comments that we were going to receive to 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 make sure that we have things right um, and have considered things. Um, most um, kind of in the next little while, um, we're working towards the June committee um, meeting. That's the June 25, uh, to working towards having draft policies presented to the source protection committee. And very closely linked will be the uh, presentation to, the, to this group on the draft policies. Uh, we'll still have to work out uh, the timelines. And uh, right now, uh, we'll get back to that uh, in a, one of the closing slides. Uh, we'll figure out whether the, the summer will be working uh, well because of the, the changes in, in, in kind of the nature of uh, COVID brings us. Uh, summer will maybe a little differently. And, uh, so we were hoping that we may be able, be able to get a, a community liaison group meeting uh, together sometime in early summer, and we'll see whether that's going to uh, that's, that's possible. Um, and but yes, essentially the, the 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 message here is it takes about a year. There's still a lot of input uh, that uh, that is possible and opportunities for comments until we have a final uh, 
product and, and, and plan that we can then submit to the, to the province. And I think with that, uh, we're kind of completed with the, the presentations. I'm gonna hand it over back to Laura and uh, we're gonna start with the, the questions. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Martin and Kyle and uh, Dave for the presentations. I know that took us a little bit uh, longer to get through. There's there's quite a bit of information to share with the uh, with the CLG members. So what I'd like to do now is we'll just do a bit of a go around um, for questions or comments, if there are pieces that you feel are headed in the right direction, um, the team would like to, to hear that. We can do both the threats assessment, climate assessment and policy approaches together. Um, I'm just gonna go through the list of, of names in alphabetical order. <laughs> uh, so everybody will get a chance. If you don't have a question or comment, that's okay. Um, feel free to just pass. And if it's something that's already been raised by somebody else, that's okay too. You can just say, you know, my point was already raised and we'll move on. What I'd like to do is just do one comment or question from each of you so that we can at least give everybody a chance to speak. And then we'll go through the list again and try to address as many as possible. Um, I know the team has received some questions and comments uh, in advance. So we'll be, um, we'll, the team will be working on providing responses to those as well. So if there are questions or comments you don't get to ask us tonight, please feel free to send them in to the, to the project team. So with that, we'll get, um, get started and I'll start with uh, Chris. Any questions or comments for you? You'll have to uh, unmute. I see. There you go. <laughs> okay, now I go. My one comment is that I thought the presentations were excellent, and uh, and I and I appreciate the opportunity to hear them. Um, as somebody who loves to look at hydrogeologic data, what I'm hoping is that the policy approaches will include some specific wording to the effect that models are only as good as the data that are available for them. And so, as Dave Van Vliet indicated in his presentation, when it comes to safe evaluating permitted um, non-municipal users, that there will be a data requirement in areas where there are gaps in a model now. So that, that does it for me, really. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, Martin or Dave? Okay, Cheryl, you know, that's, that's a great comment, um, you know, Chris, and I think that uh, one thing about when there's new applications for, for new, new users that the permit to take water programs requirements um, will, they're, they're not going to change. Um, they, they're just the source protection work isn't just in support of that, that program. Yeah, I kind of add, uh, Chris, uh, absolutely, it's a good point. Uh, it's something that, you know, it really speaks to the monitoring um, and information sharing in terms of what we have and, and, and areas where we need to have uh, additional data. Uh, it's something that we've already uh, kind of looked at and, and on are continuing to look. Uh, existing plans, uh, most of them have uh, monitoring policies in there. We're certainly going to look at that and include, uh, include and enhance on those where possible. It's always a challenge. It obviously needs funding um, and we need to figure out who can do what, uh, but certainly it is something that we will very strongly look at. Okay, thanks, Martin. Um, we'll move over to Dave Blacklock. So Dave, you'll have to unmute. There we go. Uh, Martin, uh, just wondered, um, in the policy approaches, um, these, these are policy approaches that the Lake Erie Source Protection is developing. Am I correct? I'm sorry, I couldn't understand that. Well, I'm, I want to know, does the, the policy uh, approaches that you're working on now, this is for the Lake Erie Protection area. Correct. All right. Are the other source protection areas working on things like this as well? Um, 
sorry, that's a good question. So in, it, I think Kyle was mentioning, like, right now we're focusing on the Senna Wellington Wapaku yeah, no, 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 in no, Georgetown. So we're, we're kind of focusing on that. Uh, but source uh, protection areas like, like yours, like the Lake Erie. Yeah. Area. Are they, are those other larger source protection areas, are they working on the same, are they working on policies as well? Where we have tier threes, um, there are um, essentially those areas where we have tier three studies and where we have a well of protection area quantities. Um, either those policies have been already developed and some of them have already been approved by the province. And in, in the to two areas uh, where we uh, we're currently working on, like for example, Santa Wellington and Guelph, and others are kind of in process and they still have to be approved, but there will ultimately be a, a water quantity policies for all those areas across the province where, there's a, where there are well of protection area quantities uh, with significant uh, risk levels. And Martin, if I can just, just add, D Dave, just as an example, I, I mentioned the CTC, the sort of the Credit Valley, Toronto, Central Lakes, Ontario uh, plan. So that comes into the uh, east section of Erin. So those policies are actually already uh, approved in the CTC plan and cover the entirety of the Georgetown uh, Wapakoo and majority of the Acton Wapakoo. So we, because of the watershed boundary kind of split in that area, that's why we're picking up that one little sliver of the Acton Wapakoo uh, in this policy exercise for the Grand River. But uh, yeah, there's that's an example. Halton Hamilton uh, is also another one that's close by uh, that has uh, water qual quantity policies already approved. And then there's others. Brant is a good example that's just been is in draft right now, and they're they're writing. They've written their policies, and it went to the Source Protection Committee, I believe, Martin, on April 30th. Correct? Yeah, will be will be actually submitted to the province probably by next week. Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, so I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep going and if there's more questions, we'll come back around again. Uh, Don, is there questions or comments for you? So again, Don, you'll have to unmute as each of you come on, you'll have to unmute yourselves. How's that? Is that on? That's great. Okay. Um, great presentation. Um, I'm chair of the economic development in uh, Centre Wellington. And I think it would be a great advantage to the members of that committee if we could get somebody to uh, make a 15 minute presentation on this so that the committee understands what's going on in their community and what sort of things um, may affect uh, could be street design, which stuff which we're working on. It could be where uh, industrial land goes. Uh, I think it would be very, very useful to tie the two together. Okay. So if if somebody could give me a name, Kyle or maybe Colin, uh, could come to one of the meetings. Yeah, cer certainly, Don. We can we can put something together. Absolutely, I'll, I'll talk to Colin, and we can figure out who, who best to present it. But uh, yeah, we can uh, yeah. we can absolutely do that. Yeah, yeah, just to you know, sort of enlighten some more people that are involved in the economic development. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely, Don. Yeah, we could we could provide that uh, that presentation or, or uh, kind of a paired back. We've got a yeah, uh, yeah, just similar like 10, going to council next week. So maybe that's more the level that uh, yeah, 10, that 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Not a problem. Okay. So why don't I touch base with you, Colin, and uh, uh, we can get that rolling. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, Great. Right. Thank you. We're very supportive of that. Follow up. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'll leave you to follow up with each other on that one. Um, thanks, John. Uh, next, Jan. Okay. Hi, Jen. Hi. Um, I have a question for David. Um, you said something in the report, that, or you said something in, in your talk here that wasn't in the report. Um, you had the conclusion that the current water system can meet future demand until 2031 to 2036. And you added something in, in your talk that for the short term peak demand, this is going to be shorter. 
Um, but the water supply master plan concludes that we need new water right now, that the current water system can't meet future demand like right now. So why is there this disconnect between the water supply master plan and the tier three in this conclusion? So Dave, do you want to- um... I'm gonna be unmuted. So I'm gonna start first and I'm gonna ask Colin to continue on with me. So I'm gonna, um, yeah, I feared when I was stepping through that I might've been kind of, I didn't have all the facts in front of me. So what I did try to say is the, the range of 2031 to 2036 for the tier three, there's uncertainty there because of not knowing what the, when the system system's ability to meet the peak demands is, is um, um, with the current system runs out. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll call and talk about what, what the current system's current capacity situation is. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And thanks, Jan, for your question. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you, you know, it's, you know, the graph that I'm probably trying to picture, Jan, is uh, that's uh, in the water supply master plan that shows kind of the max day projection over time and uh, and so we know that kind of within the next I forget exactly which the uh, the year is right off the top of my head but uh, we do know we need to secure additional capacity and uh, that that process needs to get going uh, sooner than later so so it's it's clear that uh, that you know that we need to get additional capacity to support uh, the growth projections for the community. And, uh, and then the, that council has supported a number of capital projects to, uh, to, uh, to start that process. Uh, it is a process. We know that there's, uh, we've got uh, the groundwater exploration program, uh, which is a capital project that uh, will be commencing uh, later this year. And uh, also we have the optimization of two existing wells, F2 and F5. Um, that uh, will also be commencing later this year. So, uh, so yeah, so lots of work to be done for sure. It's going to take some time to to bring on that new capacity. But uh, uh, good news is the projects are approved, the funding's there, and uh, and we have the ability to uh, to pr start proceeding with those. Okay, could I could I just um, then? So, how is the ministry? And if the ministry is reading this tier three report, how are they going to know that? How are they going to know? that the 2031 to 2036 isn't, um, isn't when the demand is gonna be met. So, so again, it's, it's the, the, the master plan is kind of setting the roadmap for securing additional capacity. So when we are looking at, uh, and we've talked about this uh, previously, but when we look at how we allocate capacity water, whether it's water or wastewater treatment capacity or, or water supply capacity, it's a, a much re more refined calculation that we do when we're, when we're allocating capacity for new developments. So uh, and again, that's something we watch extremely closely we update those calculations every year, um, and uh, and so that's that's something that we we keep a very close eye on as well. So it's a two pronged approach. The master plan lays out the 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 plan, the map, the path forward, but at the same time, we're managing the available capacity very very carefully. Okay, thank you. And from the ministry's perspective, um, regional hydrogeologists who review permits to take water and environmental assessments in Center Wellington have been um, in, uh, reviewing this project and have been involved in addition to myself. So they're aware, you know, have reviewed both the projects and are aware of those kind of projections. Okay, great. Thanks, Thanks. Catherine and Jan. Um, we'll keep we'll keep going and. Um, if there's more, Jan, we can we can circle back. Uh, so we have Jeremy next. Thank you. Uh, I'm also very impressed with the presentations tonight and all the all of the documentation that's been put together by uh, the tier by the project team. Um, I don't have a lot to say or or much to question, um, but I would like to say that. Um, from the perspective of the development industry and 
of the home building industry. But for the most part, uh, business people are um, open to um, tools and approaches that um, I think fit into the, the policy toolbox called stewardship, best management practices, and, and any tools that, that are reasonable and, and, and can be effective and don't necessarily um, add too much time and obviously too much money. Uh, overall, and I, I'm thinking of things, uh, for example, um, water conservation or reduction programs that could be either in consistent with the Ontario Building Code or it, uh, perhaps even above what the code requires. Um, so there's a general approach that um, the industry would like to see Im implemented in plans or implemented through the uh, policy tools that allow um, water conservation and other, other ways to reduce demand or conserve water uh, needs. I don't know if I've put it clearly, but I'm trying. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, I appreciate those comments, Jeremy. That's good. Okay. Can I just ask a sorry, can sure. I just ask a clarification on that? So so Jeremy, when you talk about best management practices for um, industries and like ICNI uh, uses, things like that, you're you're specifically you mentioned the building code, but you would also be there's also open to above like above and beyond the uh, water well, conservation tools of the building code. Obviously, I can't speak on behalf of every um, of course. Land, landowner, but I think the general um, intent is that if there are ways, and I, I know that LIDs are very common and becoming more common, I think if we can keep working on that sort of uh, approach, uh, what and and possibly other things such as rainwater harvesting or cisterns or in that kind of realm of tools, um, which may or may not be part of the building code at this point, or maybe in the future. I think, I think that's where the industry is very open and very, very supportive of uh, using water as wisely as possible and reducing it where possible. Thank you, that's, uh, that's helpful. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. We'll keep going, uh, Tom. Questions or comments for you? Unmuted there. Yeah, I just uh, want to add my um, thanks uh, to the other uh, panel members, the other group members, for an excellent uh, presentation. Um, this uh, this is policy uh, jungle land for uh, <laughs> we novices here, and um, and every iteration through it, it uh, gets a gets a little clearer. Um, the folks on the project team. Um, received some questions from me earlier on about um, uh, some comments spe specifically on the, on the uh, um, finished tier three project that seemed seemed to me at the time to sort of punt on on the the uh, question of sort of further um, analysis of, of trade-offs amongst the different kinds of policy options and so forth to, to which the tier three results could be put and and I have to say now tonight uh, that that a lot of that has been cleared up for me um, and I see uh, a, a lot of opportunity it seems to me uh, quite a number of options in that policy list and in the discussion paper um, to collaborate with other levels of government on questions of growth and so forth. Um, so, but my so the question I come down to now, having heard the presentation tonight and read the uh, pros and cons of the different uh, policy approaches, uh, what caught my eye this morning reading that was that under the land use planning approach, um, the, the uh, that that has been untested. I think the words were in the discussion paper. It doesn't say not possible. It says untested. Um, do you foresee um, the 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 county and the province and the municipality? Well, I guess the county is the municipality in this case when it comes to growth targets. 
Um, do you see do you see a, a sort of trade off analysis going forward to uh, how, how much infrastructure capacity do we need to bring on how fast um, if we at the same time kind of toggle the growth targets to uh, manage demand. Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. Um, who wants to start, Kyle or, or Colin or Martin? <laughs> well, I can start to just acknowledge and, and, and thanks, Tom, for the questions. And obviously, yes, we have had previous uh, correspondence to that we, I think, uh, still owe you uh, owe you response. But I, I uh, appreciate that, that mo more things have been becoming clearer tonight. I think your question with with regards to the, the interactions of and, and the interrelation between what we can do under the Clean Water Act and what other agencies can do or have to do uh, with regards to growth targets and uh, that's um, yeah I, I can't picture right exactly the paragraph where we say or, or where was it untested uh, but yes some of those things will probably need to be explored more we don't know yet uh, what is exactly possible and what not we. We know that there are existing policies and existing approved plans that, that link um, the growth um, kind of target development, uh, basically asking um, you know, the ministry to, to consider the tier three studies when they are doing their work and developing growth targets. So we, we certainly have those linkages, uh, but how far that can be pushed in terms of um, how what you're thinking in terms of or, or how I understand it in terms of trying to you know in terms of trade-offs uh, less growth more more you know more savings in terms of water um, that that really is I think still needs to be explored in terms of what we can do um, I think there's there's more work to be done uh, to figure out how far we can go um, so it's certainly something that we have to discuss I don't know yeah maybe Sarah or Colin uh, if you want to add anything. I'll add one, one piece too. The one thing too is we are constrained a little bit in the source protection plans in terms of the types of policies we can write about certain certain things. So when we, when we talk about growth targets with the province, those usually are not legally binding policies that we write. And we, we didn't get into that, that difference in the slide deck today, just but uh, there are different kind of legal effects of the policies that we can write. So shalls versus shoulds. Um, so an example with the province is we can tell them to consider conditions and the, on the permit state water, although I still said conditions, <laughs> I or sorry, consider, um, but uh, pretty much everything else outside of prescribed instruments uh, it are should policies, not, not shall. Right. So growth, growth targets would be should. Gotcha. Can I ask uh, just uh, um, further? I've read a different in place. It's been very confusing for me, and, and I, I, it's been hard to get a, a firm um, sense of this notion of who allocates which, who allocates growth targets and which kind of growth. Um, on the one hand, I've read that the province allocates. Uh, densities and that affects the impervious area i understand that so that's more on the kind of water rejuvenation side i guess the water going into the system uh you can have the same number of people spread out thinly or piled up high and one's one's better for mitigating um uh, the effects of impervious area uh, than the other but then there's the absolute number of people you know, sort of independent of the density. And I gather that's that's allocated through the county's official planning process. And so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, can we deal with these kind of two different silos here of uh, levels of planning and, and so forth? I, I, I realize that maybe I'm, I'm pushing you here and, and I should probably just leave it at that, leave it that Martin said you know it's it, it, it's kind of crystallizing here as you go and and i certainly appreciate that but uh i just kind of want to get it on the record that uh that maybe folks could think about this thanks tom thank you i don't, I don't know sorry do you want to uh, add a little bit in terms of that sure sure um i i appreciate um 
the challenges around silos for sure. Um, I guess the, the good news is that um, I'm the policy manager for the county and I'm, I'm here now um, at, at the, the virtual table here. And I'm also, um, I will be part of the, uh, the allocation work um, as well. Um, the, the, um, the province allocates population and employment growth through the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. And uh, currently they've allocated to 2041. And, and then, uh, so they allocate the numbers for Wellington County as a whole. And then the county um, goes through a process of, of um, basically allocating that amongst the seven municipalities. And we have policies um, in the provincial policy documents and also in the county official plan that help guide us in, in how we, we do that. Um, I can tell you that um, the province is in the uh, midst of uh, preparing new forecasts. And uh, as, as you, you might be aware, the county has kicked off um, our um, official plan review, which includes a growth management component. We've hired uh, land, econo land economists, uh, they're called Watson and Associates, who uh, we've used in the past to help us with the, um, the challenging work of, of allocating growth. Um, but their work can only go so far because we, we will need to place, uh, press the pause button to see what the province releases in terms of, of new uh, forecasts. So we're not sure yet if um, we're, we're anticipating it's likely that they will extend the forecast period out an additional five or 10 years and, and that we're likely to get additional growth allocated to the county. And so that's something that we'll need to consider as part of that work. And um, we're looking at, we currently have a deadline of July, 2022 to complete our, um, our reviews under the growth plan. We're not sure because of the pandemic and other delays, whether um, the province will extend that deadline. Uh, but we're early on in that work and I, I'd be happy to, um, to um, give you a link to the website where you can subscribe and, and eventually we'll have more information available for, uh, for the public. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, Catherine, did you have anything quickly to add before we move on? I'm just conscious of time. Yeah, just quickly to, to Tom's, one of Tom's comments that um, uh, this in CTC through, I guess through uh, municipal planning and their water budget, uh, water quantity assessment process identified that um, it was possible for municipalities to take on growth without having a, a servicing plan and they crafted policies to strengthen the links between growth and development and um, water quantity assessment. And the province incorporated those policies essentially into the 2017 update of the growth plan and now requires a demonstration of water supply and sewage servicing capacity um, with growth. I, th I guess the understanding was that um, the system had been working, that you know, there, there was an opportunity for municipalities to give feedback, but if they didn't, um, the growth could, was then incorporated into the OP, uh, uh, the official plan, sorry, ahead of an assessment of uh, servicing capacity. So those ties are now strengthened. Okay, great. Thanks, Catherine and, and everyone for responding to that one. Um, we're just at uh, 8.25. I think if folks are okay with it, we'd like to just extend for another 10, 15 minutes. Um, I've heard from a couple of you, sent a quick note saying that's okay. I hope other CLG members can, can do that as well. Um, and I'm gonna move to uh, Victor. Did you have any comments or questions on the threats assessment and the climate assessment or the policy approaches that we've shared tonight? Hi, uh, thank you, Susan, much appreciated. Um, first of all, I wanna thank the, the, all the people that's worked on this. Uh, I found it very useful tonight to, to give the context for where we go from here. Um, my background is, is more in water quality and chemical management, so I don't uh, really have a lot of comments to offer. I will go through the report one more time to, to see if something uh, 
jumps out at me. Um, my background also is more on the policy side. So it, uh, I think where you're going from here is probably going to be of, of most interest to me and, and uh, the area that I can contribute to. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now and uh, look forward to, to tracking the work if I may. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Vic. Um, I think uh, Janet joined as well. I hope you were um, able to see the presentations, Janet, and um, and get on okay. Was there any sort of questions or comments on the, the, the threats assessment, climate assessment, or policy approaches from your perspective? Um, I got in the house from getting off a tractor about 20 minutes ago, so I really wanted to get in here to listen to the conversation and wasn't able to. So um, really quickly glancing over the documents, I didn't really have anything to add. Okay, well, so glad you could uh, could make it and um, I guess today was a good good weather day to <laughs> to be out in the field. Um, if there are things when you read through it, please feel free to send questions or comments along and we'll be able to address those. So I'm glad you're here for, for the discussion, discussion piece. Um, okay, so we, we went all the way through our group, but I'm gonna circle back again, since I think most of you said it's, it's okay to extend a little bit longer. Um, and I'll just go through the list of names. Uh, and if there's nothing to add, that's fine. Just say nothing more. Um, Chris, any other questions or comments for you? No, nothing more, thanks. Okay. And Dave? So you have to unmute, there you go. Nothing else, okay. Uh, Don, any other questions or comments for you? No, I'm good. Okay, great. Jen. Uh, no. No, okay. No, I don't have any other comments. Okay, thanks, Jen. Uh, Jeremy, anything for you? No, I'm good, thank you. Okay. And Tom, any follow-up? Uh, nope, I'm good. Thanks uh, again for all the hard work, folks. Okay, great. And Vic? Uh, whoops. Uh, no, nothing from this end. Uh, thank you again. And uh, looking forward, as I said, to, to uh, future developments on this. Thank you. Okay, great. And uh, Janet, I'm assuming nothing nothing popped in in the last couple of minutes <laughs> no no i'm fine thank you okay okay great well um thanks everyone for for taking the time and uh i'm glad some of you had a chance to read through some materials in advance and as i've said a few times if there are other comments questions that you have and want to send those along now that you've had a chance to to hear the information by all means um the team would like to have those um, and what we'll do is just pass it back uh, to Martin for um, next steps and uh, wrap up. So Amitai, can you put the slides back up? I think there was a next step it's, it's slide. Slow. Yeah. Yes, one moment, I will put it right back up. Yeah, okay, thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, so yes, just to, to wrap things up. Um, so we will leave the live recording up um, for the two two weeks now until June 3. So Janet, if you want to go back and actually uh, listen to and, and, and see the, uh, the entire uh, two hours, uh, you're welcome to obviously to do that. Uh, uh, over those two weeks, we you will always everybody will have a, um, an opportunity to provide any more comments. Uh, we'll then um, finalize the meeting summary with those comments. We'll get back to the to our consultants and we'll figure out how to uh, to respond to any of those comments. And and ultimately, as we did with the previous um, CLG meetings, we will post um, the meeting summaries and the presentations. Uh, on the website um, so that there'll be every, all the documentation will be there uh, for you to to look at 
in terms of policy development, obviously that's going to continue uh, as the project team. We will we will we will start uh, and continue meeting and and push things forward. So that the aim right now is, as I mentioned, to bring draft policies to the source production committee uh, in June. It's not only just over a, over a month, so that's a pretty tight timeline. Uh, still working towards that, uh, and hopefully that we'll we'll be able to meet that. And then, um, as I kind of alluded to as well, we'd, we'd like to kind of meet with the CLG if we uh, meet the, the June 25th uh, target. We'd like to meet with the CLG uh, in the summer to present the draft water quality policies as well. Uh, we're hoping that uh, there may be an opportunity to kind of uh, figure out a good time and, and, and date. So we'll be, we'll be following up with uh, each of you um, uh, to set a date and, and kind of figure out what, what's possible. Sonia will uh, will be in touch uh, to figure things out. Um, so that's uh, where we are right now. Uh, so certainly, um, again, thank you very much for everyone to, to uh, spend the time uh, tonight um, to, to listen to us and, and, and for your questions. Uh, anything else, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. We're here to, to answer. And uh, yeah, for, with that, uh, I'd like to just uh, put everybody, um, including the project team and everybody else, thank you very much. And unless there's anything else from anybody else, uh, yes, I think it's uh, time to say good night, I guess, and uh, um, enjoy the rest of the evening. All right, good night, everyone.